Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. If it's before two in the morning, I just want you to shut off your iPod right now. I don't even <laughs> want you to, to be listening. My name is Eric. Uh, joining me this fine, fine evening slash morning uh, is uh, Michael over hey, here. Happy to be here. Really good time. I mean, I think this is uh, this is one of those that really is for when sleep is no longer an option. Yep. That is about the perfect time to listen to this. I don't know that I'd ruin it at, a, at another time. There's two fantastic films that we are doing yeah. on this, uh, let's say, less fantastic show that uh, we put on the internet. Yeah, we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do some Videodrome, followed by Amazon Women on the Moon. So we're gonna spoil both of those. Yeah, uh, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, <it's, laughs> whatever the fuck that means. One is confusing, and the other has no point. So great. <laughs> Oh, once again, kind of like our show. Yep. You can use the chapters to uh, pass right by the film you have not seen. So uh, Amazon Women would be the film you would probably pass right. up. But we're going to do Videodrome first. I have to tell you something about Videodrome. Okay. Um, and this is the, uh, the only film that I think this is true of. Wow. I'm going to have to qualify this with a couple things. Okay. Wow, this is already really complicated. This is perfect for Videodrome. I have seen Videodrome over 250 times. What? Yeah. You did not know this about me. Um, so I should say I've seen it. I have not heard it 250 huh. times. Videodrome, and I'll talk about the aesthetic a little bit, but okay. I really like the aesthetic of Videodrome. Now, we started doing this show, you yeah. and I, and uh, the show takes a long time to mix. And when I'm mixing the show, it's very monotonous, and I get a little bored. <laughs> so... I decided a long time ago, maybe I could try and, I don't know, watch TV while I do it. But that sure. you can't, you can't actually pay attention yeah, to Yeah, well, because you can't listen and listen to mixing. But, you know, I saw a Videodrome uh, just over a year ago uh, for, I don't know, the fifth or sixth time. Sure. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm so in love with the aesthetic of this film. I just want it to be playing at all times. And so when we started, I think it was the first episode of year four that I mixed. Um, I was thinking to myself, man, if I could just have Videodrome on a loop running on a separate display next to the iMac wow. while I mix, that'd be great. So uh, it takes about eight hours to mix, which is roughly five, maybe five and a half watches of Videodrome. So I have it set up. It just plays on a loop as I mix the show. Wow. So uh, in iTunes right now, I think it actually says 320 plays or that something absurd ridiculous. like that. Yeah, so I've seen this movie. I mean, I you know, I'm only half paying attention because I have to be editing. Sure. But I it keeps me company. Wow. The um the look of this is, you know, I've described my fetish for this on the show before. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pale blue light of of tube television <laughs> and uh you know, kind of illuminating the room. It's the TV static. It's the cathode the, ray. The cathode ray, man. The Betamax, the scan lines. <laughs> I just love fucking dirty awful the vertical sync problem where it scrolls yep. across oh god i love it and just that you know that glitchy as fuck editing stuff that's come out of sure videodrome uh fucking inner party system affix twin industrial video mess i mm -hmm. love all of that to me i think it, it might be my vinyl you know what i mean yeah whereas vinyl is a far inferior format to digital that people pretend is better because they like the uh the audible aesthetic sure. of it right they like the hiss and the pop and the yeah, warm sound. The warm. Most people will lie to themselves and say it's it's of a better quality, which That's is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Uh, but I mean, Videodrome it includes these scenes on these TVs, and uh, it, I mean, it just looks like absolute garbage, and I want to stare at it all <laughs> the time. Even now, I, I thought this might wear off too, but to this day, this very show, I will be watching Videodrome. As I am mixing the show about Videodrome, it's going to get pretty meta. That'll be crazy. I think I also might just love looking at Betamax tapes. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> you know, there's a Betamax joke on our show every once in a while, usually yep. when the, the format wars are cooking up. And uh, 
it's again it's like vinyl i would never collect it being kind sure. of a, a minimalist myself right I don't want that stuff you don't want to, cut, you want to collect laser disc or betamax yeah or right right eight track tapes oh but i just man i love seeing it so we're in a great position to talk about this show today because we have covered Cronenberg exhaustively yeah. on Double Feature. Yep. We know, ev- well, you and I don't know everything about Cronenberg, but sure. everybody else who watched the movies along with us and is infinitely smarter and perhaps more talented than us, uh-huh. they know everything about yep. Cronenberg. So at this point, I think our listeners could email us and teach us things. So yeah, we don't have to talk about David Cronenberg much at all, except for the wonderful special effects and body horror. Good job. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, when you think back to the shows that we've done, you know, it all comes down to Videodrome. I mean, the the body horror we discussed on the fly, yep. the uh, kind of experimentation from The Brood when we covered that, uh, the the power of the mind and the resistance stuff, and even the victims from Scanners, that group. Sure. All of that is, is sort of built into well, this and, hybrid of the old Cronenberg. Right. Well, and then we get the, the noir from Naked Lunch. We're that's pretty true. much fucking yeah. set. Yeah, that's true. And then James Woods uh, yeah. is, you know, in there too. Just to spice it up and add a, a new element. I always get the impression he's in all the Cronenberg right. movies. Um, I kind of get that a little bit too from Jeff Goldblum, which definitely isn't the case. But uh, James Woods, I mean, he's part of... I feel like he's my friend because I fucking watch this movie all the time. Mm-hmm. But he has this just kind of straight, dead-on uh, performance. Yeah. And he's um, he's the the guy you want to stuff a gun in his chest. Well, he, he kind of plays this role through Videodrome. He's kind of... Um, he's a sponge sure. for all the sure. crazy shit that goes on. You could have an actor in this role playing this character who is very self-oriented right. and reacts a lot bigger sure. to the crazy shit that's going on. Sure. But instead, the character is played as just someone... soak up the nutty. Yeah. they just He yep. just soaks it up, and then when he gets pushed, it comes out of him. Yeah, right. He's not there to show the audience's reaction to the fucked up. He's there to let the fucked up wash over him. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that noir stuff sure. of Naked Lunch, of that same, right. you know, there's another protagonist that is playing the... I mean, it's even under-stylized as far as noir goes, because a lot of times you'll get a, a flat portrayal of noir because that was the style, mm-hmm. but uh, it's not supposed to be like that. You know, the characters right. are supposed to have all this passion, and in these Cronenberg movies, you have sponge characters yeah. that will take in all of the crazy... Because if they treat it like it's nuts, the movie is less crazy. Right. You have a rational sure. person. James Woods, I mean, he this stuff happens to him. He's okay with that. Sure. His well, character's it's, fine. It's kind of all about further down the rabbit hole in sure. video yes. drum. Absolutely. The rabbit hole that starts at this interview. I fucking love <laughs> this interview. Uh, television and social responsibility. Yeah. And it's just, first of all, Brian Oblivion uh, is a bucket of crazy. He, the things he says, I mean, anytime you're listening to one of these debates where you could, you know, the debate writes itself, right. there's no, it's just cookie cutter. Well, I think the violence does it. Well, I think it does this. Well, neither of us have any facts to back a bar or whatever. So thanks, stalemate <laughs> fucking debate that did nothing. And then Brian comes in, and he's the third party, the nut point of view, the sure. reason uh, Pendulet gets on CNN. Right. And he comes out uh, in kind of the polar opposite direction and just says the most wrong things. But I, they can't be wrong because they're so crazy. Sure. They, don't even, they can't even weigh on either side. And while he's spewing the nuttiness, uh, well, I only appear on TV, on TV. Yeah. What? Yeah. Then of course you get Mr. Wood's character uh hitting on <laughs> hitting on Debbie Harry. Yeah, which is really um, that is what you do when you're in a room with Debbie Harry. Asking out the other interviewee <laughs> while they're while they're talking to Oblivion. Debbie Harry, um, by the way, is uh just a, a fantastic waist and torso of a human being yeah. for all of her naked lushness in the I've I don't think I've ever found Debbie Harry attractive outside of I mean, I just wasn't aware of it. This yeah. is clearly her. It's not like they did right. anything crazy to sure. her. She's just gorgeous in this. They dyed and, her hair brunette. That's the difference. Yeah, right. But that's her part, and that's why I even mention her sexuality in mm-hmm. this movie, because she is the um, she's the cheese in the mousetrap. Sure. 
having this kind of setup for you know this interview and a lot of the social media responsibility and the self commentary, it kind of does the double feature work for mm-hmm. us. It's a perfect outline for the film. You know, it's about overstimulation, which almost sets up this this brilliant kind of film can do no wrong in being a commentary, right? Because all it has to do from that point on is be nuts and overstimulate you. And it does have a plot and it does throw crazy plot stuff at you sure. and, you know, give you all of these completely fucked images. But that's, you know, that's more than it has to do. It right. just has to overstimulate. It could do what Amazon Woman on the Moon does and make nearly the same point. Or I guess it could go the opposite end of the spectrum and be the emotional rescue show. Yeah radio program or whatever but that's the kind of stuff that you know this movie is about the emotional rescue show people breaking down losing themselves in these extreme emotions or with this overstimulation the the take the swiss army knife out and cut me right here you know that sure kind of cronenberg sexuality or violence or i guess hybrid of both is what you expect to see from him I love the other thing she says in that scene, too. Oh, I have this friend. He'd really love video drama. Yeah. So you're an evidence-based person, so I wanted to ask you about this. We kind of brought this up um, ages ago on the show, but there is that, uh, okay, so movies, they're really violent. Are they bad for people? That kind of sure. torture porn thing that it was right. called when it was outraging soccer moms, uh-huh. you know, five, ten years when ago. When Saw and Hostel came out at the same time. Exactly. It was overstimulation of the market yeah. is what happened there. So being more fact-based yourself, I'm curious to get your take on this. Has your opinion developed any further since then? I mean, is that, you know, the arguments made this is an outlet for people's fantasies and frustrations, but do you think it has an impact at all? I mean, is this making sick people stay home? Are they sick anyways? Does it create the sickos i honestly don't believe it i still don't think it has any real effect i think that what i will say is i understand why people would believe sure that it could have an effect but the reality of the situation is i don't think people intrinsically want to hurt people i don't think that television is an outlet for people to not hurt people right i don't i mean i don't like so you're not sure you buy the argument that. Oh, well, you know, people will stay home instead of going out in the street and stabbing people because they can vent. Yeah, I don't subscribe to the ideology that, you know, the 10 other people on your block that aren't outside right right now are inside not killing people because they're watching Hostel 3. So you don't think people need to vent? (laughs) Hostel 3 might actually cause people to kill (laughs) each other. I don't know. Uh, But you don't think people need to come home from work and play Mortal Kombat in order to not kill other human no, beings. I wow, think, that's a completely rational point of view, actually. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's kind of an absurd argument when you think about the flip side, the implication of what they're saying. Right. Yeah, I've always felt that way myself, too. Can't this stuff just exist? Does it have to be defended as an outlet for people sure. to go to? But I don't know. I mean, I don't have the facts. I don't know if we could... I mean, can you do a study about that? How does that even work? I don't, I, I, I wouldn't really have any idea how to go about it. If you have some definitive evidence, I guess email doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Yeah, sure. But until you do that, I'm going to go on believing people don't want to kill people. Sure, right. Let's say for the most part. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For the most removing part. Removing the outliers, 100% of fucking people do not want to kill each other. Yeah, absolutely. So the other spectacular thing about Videodrome is that uh, this is, you know, the old days before the internet. Yeah. We have uh, these these pirated stations uh, to pick things up on and, and watch this weird stuff. And that is the premise of Videodrome, that they find these things. I mean, now we could Google Videodrome and we could find out everything, you know, the, the tape Videodrome they find. Sure. And instantly just discover whatever it is. Right. You know, there's, uh, you find some kind of obscure, I mean, even songs. Yep. You know, if you hear a song that's kind of obscure or you don't know what it is, there's a fucking app on your phone called Shazam or, you know, there's a lot of these and you hit it and I think Soundhound is the other one and it listens to the song and tells you what it is. Well, and if if you have a keen enough ear, if you can remember maybe five words in a row from the song, Google it, it, it comes up. There's another app actually called Into Now. That uh, will do the same thing for movies and TV shows. Tell you what episode of what season of a TV show. Yeah. 
So it's a lot easier to find things. You don't get these mystery pieces of footage that you have to, you know, ask around about. And, and I mean, I guess there's pros and cons of that. You know, Videodrome glamorizes that because that's the job of the sure. film. And it does a really good job. It didn't know back then that it, one day this would be gone and it would have to, you know, hold this up. Right. Instead, it just represents it as it was at the time. And that's good enough. And that yeah, absolutely. says a lot about that, that thing in and of itself. So we've lost this sense of mystery of pirated television and of accidentally, you know, footage you come across. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's sad because you don't have the hunt anymore. You don't have that thing where you're asking people. Sure. You know, you're, you're creating conversations with other human beings, showing them this footage, trying to find stuff out. You also have less of these, oh man, you have to check this out kind of films. The stuff we talked about with Ichi the Killer. Yeah. You know, where... Uh, a movie is so different or so bizarre or you don't really know what it is. It's not just, oh, you have to see this, but, oh, can you believe this? What is this? I have right. to find someone else to talk to about this thing. The kind of, I mean, everything that drives the plot in Videodrome. He finds this tape. He has to show it to everybody and see what the fuck it is. But on the other side of that, you have this renewed sense of exploration we get now from yeah. stuff. I mean, I don't want to sound like, oh, it's all bad now. In fact, I think it's better. You know, think about how much we can learn just by Googling uh, right. certain words from something. You right. know, you pull up a sure. song and you find out it's a cover by an original artist. Sure. You pull up a uh, a movie and, you know, you learn, I mean, you can see the entire cast list and you, right. you could do our show, basically. And, well, yeah. And then you could find out whether or not it's going to give you brain cancer. Uh, I don't know if there's an app for that. Think of how much we find, too. I mean, you and I, that's how we find films. Sure, absolutely. You know, a lot of times we'll get emails from people. Oh, where, where did this come from? How do you, right. like, what is your discovery path? And I don't know about you. You just click I, through. You yeah. just click through. That's it's the way the, to do well, it. Well, it's that, that joke people make about Wikipedia. You go yeah. on there and you click a word and you, you start by looking up, you know, 20th century philosophy and you wind up, you know, in, in dump truck engines. Yeah, it's uh, just these bizarre paths you start clicking down. And I think we find so many more films. It's so much easier to find things we enjoy sure. and to dig further into these corners. And for people who make obscure films to, I mean, really, really obscure films to get them seen. Yeah. Absolutely. And we don't lose films over time the way, you know, a lot of the weirder stuff we've done from the 60s or 70s or whatever we i freaks coming up again yeah you know maybe we never would have a freaks is legendary but you know what i mean sure some of these other directors or some of these others might something maybe even like amazon women on the moon right on the commentary for this movie on the criterion disc cronenberg's talking about you know how when he was younger or whatever he picked up pirated cable and he was always worried. He had this fear that he would kind of see something he wasn't meant to see. Yeah. And that was sort of the basis for the film. And that's another thing I kind of miss too. I'll listen to police scanners and stuff every sure. once in a while. Yeah. Just for a novelty value. So in fact, I won't listen to the Uptown One by our studio because it freaks me out. Uh -huh. But I'll listen to other districts or whatever. And you do sort of get that. Oh, maybe, you know, it's not meant for you and it's live. And what right. if something comes across there? It's um, it's something that kind of raises the hairs on the back of your neck. But the alternative of this is more intellectually appealing. The newer system is more intellectually appealing to me. You can find things out. You can do your own research. You can become more informed. Sure. We'll miss that kind of uh, disc swapping thing. But, you know, there's, there's ways we replace that. So I do have a, a small technical note about Videodrum that I think is kind of cool. There's... Um, a technology that was sort of pioneered for this movie in kind of the way we talked about Lucas on the Willow show uh -huh. and how he came up with industrial light and magic because right. they needed to create these effects. Uh, Cronenberg, they're, they're filming this movie, obviously that's about television screens and uh, they're looking gorgeous on here. And one of the ways they do that, there was a longstanding problem with filming televisions before this and mm -hmm. We don't have this problem with DSLR filmmaking and things of that nature anymore, but uh, mostly because we have HD TVs now too. Sure. But it used to be when you had an old school camera and you pointed it at an old school monitor, you had 
flickering and vertical sync stuff. Sure. And have you seen that before? Yeah, absolutely. And so the Videodrome crew came up with this technology to basically synchronize the camera with the display it's filming. So that's that kind of projection they used to use to fake, you know, right. film and television where they would project it onto the, you know, they would make a fake TV essentially yeah. in order to do this. That isn't needed anymore. They could film authentic, you know, yeah. TV signals by basically just lining up the, the hertz of the different screens. It's a small thing, but you could see where it's the type of thing somebody with, let's say, an aesthetic fetish for cathode tubes might, yeah, uh, right. might enjoy <laughs> for that other person out there somewhere, I hope, who has found our podcast. The real cult status comes not from obscure technologies invented for Videodrome, but I mean, probably from the gore and oh, the yeah. bizarre imagery. And that's always the case with Cronenberg, you know, the, the gore and the violence especially. Uh, but as we're watching this movie, I mean, I can't help but think, you know, a man's insides crawl out of his body, his fucking face splits open. Right. And God you hear damn. him gargle his own organs over the wireless PA system. You can't help but think about it. Especially with a movie like this, the the Larry Cohen, God told me to kind of uh, matching abdomen vaginas yeah. thing going on there. I really, I just love the notion of the human VCR. Yeah, isn't it's that great? so good. Especially for something as fucked up as Videodrum. It's bringing into physicality the type of things the movie's sure. talking about. Right. Which is a lot of times with Cronenberg and body horror, we've discussed, you know, physical manifestations of more abstract ideas. Right. That's how he can make a movie that's as abstract like this. And you still get some kind of semblance of, I mean, he's taking the abstract ideas and making them physical. And then the physical stuff probably is a product of that. Seems abstract. It seems right. completely bizarre. Any movie that's old enough and has a cult status, I guess, has an influence on other people, too. Sure. That's how I found out about Videodrome, which was uh, actually how I found out about David Cronenberg years and years and years ago before we even did this show. This film had a kind of a music reference. Actually, now that I think about it, there's another something that's come around a little bit more recently there's a prolific and reanimator song that um, it's off the album, The Ugly Truth, that actually samples the line, you know, about his head or whatever. The head in the box? Yeah, it, the song's called Box Within a Box, and it uses that sample. A lot of songs sample from this movie. Um, a lot of the bizarre dialogue or even the sound effects. Sure. It's a heavily sampled film, and I mean, that's what needs to happen with this film. But there's a band as well called uh, Video Drone. Uh, V-I-D-E-O-D-R-O-N-E. And they just have one album. It's synthy, it's creepy, it's heavy. I, I fucking love it. And that's how I found the movie. Pre-internet. Well, I mean, if, you, if we want to talk about how we find our ways to movies... Please, I'm dying. I'm um, dying to So know. there's this film that we're covering on the show now called Amazon Women on the Moon. Another uh, method to experience found narratives. Yeah. Right? It's not totally gone. It's... One of the most obscure movies I think we've ever done on the show. Sure. And that's weird because of the cast. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it on paper, the amount of at least then famous actors sure. that are in this lots film. Lots of actors. Lots of actors. Uh, should should bring it up at least somewhere, but it's almost impossible to find. I had to order the DVD off the internet just to see it. Sure. Uh, but, I mean, as with all things, it comes from following a name. And uh, the name that I followed to Amazon Women on the Moon was our uh, our buddy Joe Dante. Oh, I thought you were going to say Peter Horn. So Peter Horn was the redheaded kid. You remember Children of the Corn? Yeah. He directs a bunch of the stuff in there. Oh, my God. Yeah, he's also an actor. He was in St. Elsewhere, that sure. whole Tommy Westfall universe thing. We've yeah. discussed that before. DoubleFeatureShow.com, right. Tommy Westfall, look it up. Sorry, go ahead. But... It it was it was kind of a a weird mix because I found this film looking through Joe Dante stuff. Yeah, but then I saw names like Russ Meyer, sure, and uh, Henry Silva, and I ended up just fucking you know I'm gonna watch this movie. This seems like a great time. I didn't know what the fuck it was about. Sure, I still don't really know what the fuck it's about. Russ Meyer's um, ending on this is, or pre-ending ending is great. That's one of my favorite of the little shorts. But what the film ends up being is actually something a lot more prolific than mm. the film would lead you to believe. Because 
ostensibly it's a goofy bunch of hey what if this yeah you know that's the premise for 95 percent of the movie sure but it's this overarching statement about youth and their inability to pay attention to shit and and the just the tv generation of the late 80s and it's just kind of a commentary on how it's all just garbage sure. on TV sure. at this point. And there's no respect for anything or anyone. And that's why a lot of the little sketches get to be very irreverent and very pointed yeah. and mean. I mean, they're just mean characters. I can hear in my head already critics from the 80s probably saying, oh, and making a movie about how pointless and irreverent everything is, you actually just made a pointless and irreverent movie. Right. It's one of those things. I mean, of course I would imagine critics don't like it because it mocks the tradition of sure. That short is fantastic. I mean, the, where they review the guy's life, it's, uh, it's about as valuable as I find film reviews to be. It's amazing. I think it probably says more about film reviews than they intended for me. Yeah. Well, I love it because they just have no fucking business. No, they don't. And that's what it is, is they yeah. have no business. I take the same thing out of it. And who the fuck do they think they are? Who cares? What jerks? So like you said, the late 80s. I mean, this is, you know, we're before Netflix and the iTunes uh, season pass when channel surfing still existed. Sure. And this will allow us in kind of the same way. I would actually say in a, a totally different way than Videodrome, but the same idea to re-experience channel surfing in a more authentic type of... I mean, that's right. all the movie is, sure. is channel surfing. It makes a commitment to stay to that strictly, and it celebrates that. It does it really well. It starts with the uh, the man having the worst day ever, which sure. is a, a perfect place for this to start. It's just... Blunder after blunder until he falls out a window and done. Yeah. And the fact it ends on bam, done, move on. And that's what you get every time from there. It reminds me that that sketch uh, especially reminds me of, you know, the best of what I loved about Robot Chicken. Yeah. Just short, punchy sketches. The shorter, the better. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Robot Chicken, as it, it went along, uh, Robot Chicken is an adult swim show. It's sure. It's a mixture of kind of stop motion and claymation and various other things. Sure. But it's Seth Green and a couple uh, right. a couple smart guys putting together this stuff. And as the show went on, the sketches got more elaborate and, you know, still a lot of good stuff in there. But especially in those first couple of years, it was just short, punchy, irreverent, made no sense. Yeah. Here's the joke, punchline, ksh, done. Well, yeah, and that's a great parallel to Amazon Women. The one thing that I think uh, the that they really take advantage of. And that is one of the strengths of the film Mm. is as the film goes on, it's actually, it's an improv technique when you're coming up with an improv show um, where you do your first few sketches or, you know, scenes or whatever the hell you want to call them. Yeah. And they are all overarching and have nothing to do with each other. And as your whole piece comes to a close that's when you start mixing them up and bringing sure. back the jokes and sure. putting the guy from the scene where he gets sucked into the tv into the other sketches yeah, right. and bring back henry silva just to say bullshit or not and by yeah, the end right. it's all just a big fucking jumble and that's your head that's your yeah. head at 5 a.m when you've been channel surfing through mtv and late night movies right in 1987 well, it's that late night TV company, you know, that um, you have nothing to do. You put it on and it kind of might just keep going forever. You feel sure. like it will always be there. Uh, it, recently, especially, we've been talking a lot about the, the lazy Sunday afternoon thing. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of what, man, it doesn't get any closer to that, by the way, than that yeah. video pirates thing. Yeah. And then mocking the FBI warning and stuff in there. It's great. Talking about how laser discs don't even work on their systems. Sure. Can't record Nonsensical on Nonsensical arguments that still work today. <laughs> but it's our love of things like Trick or Treat or Four Rooms or Chillerama, that stuff. Uh, it's harnessing that stuff we've come to love in its rawest form. Sure. I think a lot of uh, really the joy I get around that is... You know, that's so much experience in so little time. You're yeah, exactly. All these different stories. So first of all, you know, you take a lot in and especially for people like us who 
at this point, film is study for us. Mm -hmm. We just enjoy learning stuff about it and seeing what other people are contributing and all these ideas. So you get to take in a lot of that, but you also have to like something. I mean, there's just so much to pick from. Well, and that actually brings me to a point that I was, I was actually curious and I hope this doesn't, uh, this doesn't break our little agreement here but which one of them would would be your favorite if you had to pick one sure yeah that's tough uh i mean there's so many ideas the the nature of it is that it just keeps stirring things for you sure but i mean first there's harvey's funeral yeah so that's the roast of harvey pitnick it's not my favorite but i like that it's absurdist and it's a lot different than the other pieces just in how i mean it's fucking as mean as possible yeah it uh, it wouldn't even be as mean if it didn't cut back to his wife, but that yeah. makes it, that just digs oh, it in a so little more. Oh, it's so good. I like that they give reaction shots of a dead man, right. which is the best. And then she gets up and tells jokes. Well, and I love that they used a bunch of really old roast sure. masters. Yeah, definitely. That just definitely. they're totally their their jokes don't make sense. Sure, they're not even necessarily aware of what's going on yeah um and it just seemed to make it so much meaner because they were so far disconnected sure from this guy there's a couple that i feel like i could talk to other people about and yeah. i like that the guy who isn't invisible yeah i mean the that's all you have to say man. and the other person will enjoy it just as much having not <laughs> oh, even seen it i fucking love that uh, because in practice it's just an exercise of a mental idea that was funny yeah you know it's not sure. like they really expand on the idea it's just oh what if this guy yeah he thought exactly. he'd achieved invisibility he didn't check and i mean that's funny yeah i think for me um the ones that really stand out i really love the first bullshit or not Oh, the, yeah. Uh, Bullshit or not's far and was, away my favorite. I mean, that's it. Was Jack the Ripper actually the Loch Ness Monster? Sure. Uh, just when Using he poses that question. Using undiscovered evidence. Yeah. That's yeah. good, too. But yeah, you're right. When Even he just poses that. that initial question. It's just a sock in the face yeah. to all pseudoscience. And you just, your jaw hits the floor and, sure. and you just wonder what the, how the hell. Do you think that's going to be one of those things where in 10 years it's not even satire? That's just literally, it's, it's on the history it's channel. Possible. Well, it, it'd be right up there with the possibility of blacks with no soul when they discover that's a real disease. Oh. I hate you. The David Allen Greer thing. Yeah, I fucking love those are Don good No too. Soul just Simmons. His face. I mean, yeah. that was all of his performance. Every character that guy ever did was, right. it was based on his ability to really <laughs> perform like that. And I also, I mean, I love the Russ Meyer one with Ray's porn video. Sure, uh, sure. I just, I, I love it because it seems so obvious where it's going. It's, you know, it's your personal porn video. Sure. And it just takes this turn and everything just goes, it's back to the apartment. Yeah, right. But in a totally more fucked up way. Sure. And it gets so dark to the point where they're, they're shooting themselves and each yeah. other and just, you have to live with this now. Yeah. And I just keep going back to Smiley Russ Meyer. Take this video home if you've not nothing sure. to do this it's, Saturday night. It's the way Russ Meyer probably thinks of his movies. Sure. Oh, I'll lure you in with the nudity, but wait, there's an adventure in store yeah. for you. But I like that. I like the idea that we've crafted an adventure and, you know, we've Trojan horsed it via pornography. Right. Or, I mean, it's really just via mystery because he doesn't even know what it is. But, you know, you get ready for it's almost a choose your own adventure. Kind yeah. Of. I mean, it just happens to him. He has no saying. Right. It. But going into something and thinking, oh, this could be a sexy, fun time. Wow. I just found myself in this web of intrigue. It's yeah. the game. You yeah. Know? Remember it is. when we did the, the David Fincher movie, sure. the game? Yeah. Totally what that's about. And unraveling that is, I mean, that's really exciting. That's one of those concepts. You know, there's a few of these I could have stayed on for quite yeah. some time. Well, that's, I mean, and you, you they said They all make it. their point. They're, yeah. you know, they're good the length they are, but I could have stuck with them. Yeah. You said it earlier on, um, in the, the one with the, the TV remote, you said sure. this is an entire film premise. Yeah. It, well, and that one literally is an entire I know, I know it is, sure. but, but that's kind of what a lot of these are. You could go, somebody could Theoretically, waste let's an say. extra 75 to 80 minutes of our time sure. making an entire movie out of critics criticizing a person's sure, life sure. or a guy who uh, makes 
hair out of rugs or a museum (laughs) going out of business. Like these are full film premises Mm -hmm. that they don't really, they, they understand this is a one trick pony. Yeah. And that's as it's meant to be. I mean, that really is what's for the best. Uh, I'm, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a couple that you just, you know, the Russ Meyer thing is perfect the way it is. Yeah. If we drew it out anymore, maybe it would become tired. We'd watch it anyways. I don't sure. fucking know. It doesn't matter. But it's, I mean, isn't that the thing I just said about Robot Chicken? Here yeah. I am contradicting myself. You know, short, punchy. That's the best thing, my favorite thing about so many of these. And I'm begging them to lose their edge because I enjoy them so much. Yeah, exactly. Leave your audiences wanting more. Well, and that's what that the overarching storyline to Amazon Women, right? The actual movie, Amazon mm-hmm. Women on the Moon. What I love about that is they have this excuse to actually have a film with a plot and a story sure. and all this bullshit. But instead, they go the planet terror route yeah. uh, where whenever anything interesting happens, scene missing, bunch of stuff, and we're back and nothing makes sense again. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I felt the same way about Amazon Women on the Moon as I do about, uh, you know, Twilight Zone marathons. Just yeah. something about the, I don't know if it was the fact that it was kind of a science fiction story or, you know, it was about as sci-fi as any of those win. It, it kind of sure. went the 50s monster movie right. sci-fi route. But, uh, you know, Twilight Zone kind of does the same thing because there are these short episodes um, when I w- sat down and started watching Twilight Zone stuff, I actually intended to finish every last piece of it. Uh-huh. And it turns out it just takes up weeks of your, uh, your life. So it's a lot to get through, but short, high concept, you go in, you do it, you exhaust it, and then you leave and you do something totally different the next week. There was, uh, it was last New Year's Day. Um, we've talked about Rob Sheridan a little bit. And I want to give him full credit for finding this because it was a great day. But he uh, he mentioned on Twitter, Rob Sheridan's the one of the artists for Nine Inch Nail stuff. Mm-hmm. We talked about him on the Social Network show. On his Twitter, he mentioned New Year's Day. What a fitting mood. There's a Twilight Zone marathon. And he was crediting the Sci-Fi channel or whoever. I think it was Sci-Fi. Sure. That put the marathon on because that was the right feeling for the right. That's what you want. New Year's Day, it's cold, everything's closed, you're going to stay in and watch the the sci-fi channel. Um, It's probably always a good time for a Twilight Zone marathon. But that's, you know, the same thing as we're talking about today, but for an an early morning or a long long afternoon, just hang out and fucking watch the Twilight Zone. Watch short clips of people in peril. (laughs) When is that not perfect? There's a, you know, there's one of the shorts in here that I feel like we just saw in the blob. You remember the condom part of the blob? Oh, yeah. Where he yeah. goes in to buy them. And then, it's kind of a similar, right. similar gag. You go into the store and you think everybody's staring at you because you're going to buy condoms. It's this weird thing you really only experience when you're younger. Maybe not. Maybe you experience yeah. it when you're older, sure. too. I, don't I guess know. It, I've, never, I've never purchased condoms from somebody I knew. Yeah, I mean, that's not a thing that... Yeah, it's in both cases, it's somebody yeah. you know. Yeah, there's still this sort of, uh, like, a spotlight is going to come down. A balloons will rain. I yeah. mean, it's your worst fear in here. It goes to the extreme. Um, I'm a big Planned Parenthood supporter, so I buy condoms at Planned Parenthood. But if you don't have a date, I would imagine that Russ Meyer will probably loan you a videotape. And stick it in your fucking stomach. The website for this very show is doublefeatureshow.com. Um, the name of the show is Double Feature, but the website, doublefeatureshow.com, which would make the email address, this could be confusing, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Okay, I've got that so far. Um, stop wasting time. We need to talk about next week. Oh You're always God. rambling on in the end here with all your stuff that you need to talk about i know i've got so much to say but what what we're doing next week is uh we're, we're bring- strapped for cash so we're doing a kilopalooza yeah please we're give us back. money we're if doing- you haven't caught the hints we're dying Some it's more- the end of the year and we need your dollars and we're uh we're going to try to bring the money out of you by just it, this is possibly it's a telethon i i mean the last kilopalooza was hella fucking bloody well yeah it was saw yeah but this i mean this could possibly top 
Saw for bloodiest fucking Killapalooza, and it's only five movies. All right, so what do you got for me? We're going to do the Final Destination films. But Final Destination, I thought you guys refused to do that because I emailed you every single week and asked you, where's the Final Destination, Killapalooza? Yeah, sometimes we watch more fucking film. Bye.